Welcome back to the Crash Course Podcast. My name is Craig Crash Collins, joined as always by Brandon Scott, otherwise known as B. Scott. We've got a lot to get into tonight. Uh, It's part one of basically a two-part series uh, because it's college football time again, which means uh, we're going to go through every, well not every school, but but, uh, Purdue, IU, Notre Dame, Um, We're going to talk a little bit about some other schools as well as we have a new segment, a new little uh, bit that we're going to uh, premiere here in just a few moments about you know some of the schools to watch across the state. So uh, a lot to get into tonight as far as college football is concerned, and of course you know next week we'll talk uh, the national uh, stage as well. So B Scott, college football, an exciting time of year. You know me, I love college football. I've already got my season tickets ready to go for Purdue. Uh, but you talk about the national scene. What we really need to talk about is like four or five teams. We don't need to really talk about anything else. Yeah, pretty much. Ohio State, Clemson, Oklahoma, Alabama, Georgia, Notre Dame. That's six. It makes me laugh yeah. that like, of course, like when we'll talk about the whole realignment thing next week too. But like, it makes me laugh that like. Oklahoma joins the SEC because that's almost like another guarantee for them to get in. And then, of course, you look at the top five this year. Um, you know, it's it's all those same teams are right up there. And, I mean, like I said, we'll get into it more next week. But it's just like, it, I you know, it definitely needs changing. And that's why I'm hoping that, like, that 12-team playoff comes sooner rather than later because I think that does a lot more for, you know, spreading the wealth a little bit among the college football grades because even with the BCS, I mean, you know, I guess yeah, I was like you. It was uh, Chris uh, Simmons that I talked to that week when we talked about the twelve team, uh, twelve teams. I think it was uh, during uh, your you know gauntlet of college World Series coverage, B Scott. But uh, you know, my gauntlet of no sleep. Right, exactly. Like the BCS. Uh, did more for like spreading the wealth than what the college football playoff has. It's, it's so odd to me. I thought about it even a little bit today that you know it seems like we just can't get the college football formula right. Before the BCS, it was no, 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 no. It is right. It's just not right at the at the at the level that everybody needs it to be right at. No, well, but here's the thing though, like. For whatever SPS, reason, SPS has got it right. Well, true. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right on that. I thought you were saying it's right to an extent. I'm like, yes, it is right from that angle. Um, from the fact that like the it, so I guess that's what I mean. It's so odd that you know the highest level of college football can't seem to get it right. Everyone at and I mean I, I I don't know. I mean I guess it's because they just don't care enough. Like not the schools themselves, but the NCAA that like. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, you know, a, technically a team that was ranked 22nd could go into the postseason and win in FCS, but oh, well, it's FCS. Like, But for whatever reason, it's like, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have every team play in bowls, and we're going to have certain teams designated for certain bowls, and whoever is, you know, not even so we're not even going to have the top two teams play each other. We're going to have... You know, the we're going to have Notre Dame play, you know, X team. We're going to have Alabama play in the Sugar Bowl versus, you know, the second best team from the Big Ten. And if they win that game, that clinches their championship. And then we go to the BCS where it's like, it's football, but computers. And then, right. um, <laughs> and, but at least in that system, it wasn't, you know, eliminated the human bias of it. And now you inter- introduce the college football playoff, and it's nothing but, or it's gotten to a point where it's nothing but bias. There wasn't as much bias in the beginning as evidenced by Florida State, Oregon. Those teams, now granted, those teams haven't really been to that same stage. The Pac-12 is on fire. The Big hey, 12 is about to Oregon be. Oregon made it to the first national, the first playoff national championship. Right, but I'm saying like those teams like after that point. That's what I'm saying. At the beginning, the college oh, football yeah. playoff was much less biased than it is now. It's become more biased as like it's been a perfect storm of the college football playoff becoming more biased and then no other teams really coming out into the fold to make them not biased anymore. So it's oh, yeah. Yeah. it's you know or like I said the Big 12 the Big 12 and Pac 12 are currently on fire which only leaves you you know the Big 10 which you know the only team that the college football playoff accepts is you know Ohio State then yeah, you've got else from the Big 10 is really worthy of it. Right, but you would like I to guess think one year Penn State had, right. had and, the argument, and Michigan State made it one year. Yeah, but that's and they got 
pumped. Yeah, that's and that's what I'm saying is that like you, it, it's gotten to a point that unless you're Oklahoma, the Big Twelve champion isn't going. The right. you know unless you're Ohio State, you're you're not going to. If you win the Big Ten, you're not going. Unless you're Clemson, you win the ACC, you're not going. Uh, the only conference that you can really say you can win and get in is the SEC, which Heck, in the SEC you can lose and still get in. Right. So um, that's really what we're dealing with. I want to thank Toddle for the follow in there. We got some early people in the chat. I love it. Um, Haas as well uh, dropped a follow earlier. Thank you guys all for uh, contributing in the chat. We love getting that uh, audience interaction going. But yeah, I mean, it, it's just. Um, you know, and, and the and the thing that annoys me so much about that is the fact that you like basically are saying that these are the five best conferences in college football. But if you win three of them, then you don't matter because even though you, this is supposed to be the best of the best. So yeah, I mean, like I said, we'll get more into it next week. Uh, you know, this week is strictly about uh, you know Indiana schools um, and. Uh, you know, let's go ahead and jump right in here. Uh, we have a new segment. Uh, I don't know how frequently we're going to update this. It's not going to be every week, um, but we're going to revisit this uh, list a few times throughout the course of the year. Um, and that is our Indiana Ambassador Power Rankings. If you can think of a better name, like seriously, let me know. I haven't thought of like a catchy name for it yet. Um, but basically what it means, because originally B. Scott and I wanted to do like state rankings to appoint a state champion, and we do plan on appointing a state champion at the end of the year. Um, it was kind of a fun idea last year because everybody, because of the shortened season and because of Ball State's success, everybody was kind of like, oh, well, is Ball State the best team in the state? Obviously not really. If they went up and played Notre Dame, they probably would lose, although they did almost beat Notre Dame a couple years ago in South Bend. Um... You know, so we're like, well, let's kind of tweak it a little bit. Let's put a little bit of a caveat in there. Let's say that, you know, like, what teams are exciting? What teams represent the state well? What, when you think about Indiana college football, what teams get you excited? Because that that doesn't always necessarily mean it's going to be Notre Dame at number one. Because Notre Dame, you know, is it necessarily, you know. Most the most exciting same with like iu purdue whatever so it's not necessarily like oh yeah hands down these are the top five schools in indiana it's how do you look how excited are we to talk about you week in and week out so we're going to go ahead and hop right into that now and we're going to start i'm going to go five i haven't listed one through five in my list we're going to go five through one actually um number five on the list uh is purdue um, and by the way, B. Scott and I came to a consensus on this uh, yeah. list, so that way it would wouldn't be I, I super say, different. I, I do want to give an honorable one of my honorable mentions once we get done giving our list. Okay, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so this is this is a team that could creep into this top five power rankings. Yeah, definitely teams to watch are uh, in play as well. But Purdue is our fifth best or our fifth team as far as the Indiana Ambassador Power Rankings. Uh, they were two and four last season. It was their third straight losing season under Brom. Uh, Coach Brom is 19 and 25 in four seasons at Purdue. His highest finish was uh, in 2018 where the Boilers tied for the Big Ten West in uh, uh, like for second place that season. Um, and so... Purdue's on there because they are slightly intriguing in the sense that, like, I mean, I don't... Have two All-Americans, like, preseason All-Americans, and two potential first-round draft picks. Yeah, right. And, that, the, and it's like, it's some, there's some interest, there's some intrigue there because of that. Well, and, like, I don't, I mean, you're more plugged into the Purdue, like, message boards and fan base than I am, but I don't know if this is, like, a make-or-break year for Brom. Um it, it, on a, from a fan base perspective, it is, but from a financials and um, athletic department standpoint, it probably is not because last year it was a free pass. I mean, honestly, half the team ended up getting COVID. You had injuries. I mean, they didn't even play the last two games of the season. So that was a free pass. And then the year before, you can't really put too much on them when you have your two best players go down on the same play with season-ending injuries. So... Yeah, I it, mean, there's been some there's been some hard luck for Purdue. So that's what that's another thing that makes them so intriguing is because of the past two seasons and the circumstances that have 
come across for both of those seasons. Right, and that's why I wasn't 100% sure if it was an actual, t- uh, you know. You, you, the national media will put him on the hot seat just because of him being like the seventh highest paid coach in the entire country. Um, they'll put him on the hot seat just basically because of that. But truly, he's not on the hot seat because like I, of the, the things I just stated. Right. Now, if he has another bad year this year with everything going okay, he could be on the hot seat next year. Gotcha. Also because his buyout shrinks significantly after next year. So, yeah, so that's why uh, they are number five. Number four, we're going to go to the NAIA. We're going to talk about Marion. They're preseason number 10. They have three straight wins over St. Francis, which, by the way, St. Francis uh, was your 2017 and 18 NAIA champs. Uh, They lost in the 2019 NAIA final, the morning side, and they were bounced in the first round of 2020. So this is a team uh, that's not won a national championship since 2015, a team used to a lot of success, a team that had a weird year last year made even kind of more worse and wonky by the fact that they were bounced in the first round. The last actual season they played, they were so close to ending that short title drought. Um, and they were uh, forced away by Morningside. They've shown that they're the best NAIA school in the state by beating St. Francis over the last few years. So, I mean, this is a team that's primed and ready to go, ready to get back, ready to strap those shoulder pads on and get and, and get to play in football. Uh, and that's why I think, you know, they're really intriguing at number four uh, because, you know, heck, this is a team that could be playing for a national championship when it comes to it, down to it in NAIA. And, I mean, when you talk about Indiana college football and teams playing for a national title, I mean, there's not much you can say on the FCS or FBS side except for, like we talked about, Notre Dame. Um, but, uh, I mean, this is basically, you know, the equivalent of what Notre Dame is to in the NAIA schedule. Exactly. I mean, this is a team, they're fun to watch. And occasionally you can catch their games on ESPN2 or ESPNU, especially later in the season. Or if you are in the Indy area, Indianapolis area, sometimes you can catch them like on my ND, my ND TV 23 or whatever it is. But like, I think sometimes Greg Rickstaw calls their games. Yeah, something like that. They're pretty fun. They're fun games to watch. And if you're, if you're in the Indianapolis area, it's a cheap ticket. It's a good Thursday night thing to go do. And I mean, they, they put on a good show. So they're, that, they're intriguing because of, because, you know, they're, a, a, they're, they're closing in on becoming a, an NAIA power, which is cool because this is a program that has not been in existence very long. Like they won the NAIA championship I think in like their second or third year of existence. So that's pretty, they're, they're, it's pretty exciting. And you know, you see a lot of local talent that ends up at Marion um, for all sports. So that's one of the cool things about that team as well. Yeah, it's kind of a shame that NAIA football across the state is a little under the radar because, I mean, you have so many good schools. St. Francis, Marion, is, IWU isn't NAIA, is it? Or are they like Division Two? Indiana, Indiana West. Westland? Yeah. You know, I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, I think they might be in AIA. Okay. Yeah, but and that's what I'm saying is there's so many, like, good programs. Even if they're not, there's a lot of good programs that are below the uh, F, like, the Division One level. Uh, you know, when you talk about, like, UIndy, uh, Hanover, uh, schools like that. So, I mean, um, you know, it. You, you, I'll just go ahead and say it. You, Indy, is one of my teams that's honorable right. mention teams to watch. That's a, a team in the um, Division One, Two A, or Division One A. That is fun to watch as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Hanover would be mine because they were. Uh... Or, or, but you also got to look at. I mean, it's so tough when we're making this list because then you got intriguing matchups throughout the year as well. It's but like the Monon Bell with DePaul and uh, Wabash. Right. I mean, if you if we're going to talk about power rankings for fan bases, I think Wabash has to be right up there with the best of them. Oh, yeah. I don't know how they are throughout the rest of the season, but mode on bell time, they show out. Like, so when I worked uh, for uh, MS, like, uh, 1070 The Fan down in Indy, I did, a, you know, I worked on the college football show down there, and there was a lot of... Uh, you know, when we do, do score updates, we would I would fo- of course follow every single school, including like Division Three and stuff like that. And DePaul, Wabash, I mean, there's some good you know teams and some good talent and some good games. 
uh, they oh, get yeah. played on those levels. So uh, um, I know uh, Trine is usually pretty good as well. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of good football Franklin, outside Franklin of college. what your norm is when it comes to the state of Indiana. Guys, did you realize how much college football is in the state of Indiana? There's just at your own fingertips that anybody can go to for super cheap anytime. I, I don't think people truly understand that in the state of Indiana. They think basketball, but there is so much good college football around here. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, moving on to number three. Preseason not uh, number nine, eleven and t- uh, preseason number nine, Notre Dame. Uh, they're third on my list, and I thought that that was a good place for them uh, because uh, that's about my excitement level for them. It's it's middle middle of the road um, because over. Oh the- really? They're- that's it for you? I mean, look at your background. You went with Notre Dame. Well, so uh, the background on Zoom. Uh, is Notre Dame. What you can't see is the background on OBS, and what you'll see on the YouTube channel is uh, from the Oak and Bucket game. So I have all three teams technically in the, in the in the frame here, like when you look at it on YouTube. So that part of it is covered, I promise. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, they're 11 and 10 versus the top 25 over the last five years, one and two in bowl games versus ranked teams, 0 oh and two in the college football playoffs. So it's one of those things where like, Sure, we'll get excited for you because it's the only chance on a you know college football playoff level that we can get excited for football in Indiana. But at the same time, like you, it's probably going to be more of the same. It's probably going to be you're either going to be in the college football playoff conversation and not get there, or you're going to get to the college football playoff and you're going to get smacked in the mouth. Yeah. So I don't have much to say about Notre Dame. All I know is that. Notre Dame this year, their starting quarterback is a uh, is the former starting quarterback at, from Wisconsin, Jack Cohn. Yeah. Um, number that doesn't, that doesn't put too much fear into your hearts because Jack Cohn was just a he was a game manager, hand yeah. the ball off to Jonathan Taylor. That was that was essentially his job. Well, hey, I mean, he's got some good talent. We'll get to it more here a little bit later, but he's got some good talent in the backfield with him at Notre Dame too. So he may not have to do a whole lot much different than that. Although it'll be a little bit different than handing off the ball to Jonathan Taylor. Um, yeah. Number two is Indiana. They're a preseason number 17 team. It's the first time since 1969, which is 52 years, um, that IU has been ranked in the preseason poll. Um, quarterback Michael Penix is back. Uh, that's going to be uh, really exciting for IU fans. They did lose to Ohio State by one score. They, defeat, they defeated the rest of the Big Ten teams they faced last season. So, I mean, there was talk about them being in the Big Ten championship game, uh, potentially when uh, Ohio State didn't meet the game requirements. I don't think that was really up for debate because that's why they changed the rules around uh, for Ohio State to get in. Um, but, I mean, heck, I mean, that was one of the best IU seasons in recent memory um, for pretty much, you know, anyone in our generation because it's been so long since IU's been relevant on a, a national and Big Ten stage. So, um, you know, a great season for IU and a lot of momentum going into 2021. Yeah, it'll be interesting. The biggest thing for them, it's intriguing, is health at quarterback and if they can continue the success that they saw last year when a lot of teams were down because of COVID. So, is this team a uh, shot, in the, uh, just a, a flash in the pan, or are they are they legit? Let's find out. And finally, at number one, B. Scott and I's alma mater, your state ambassador, number one sure, team, sure. Ball sure. State. B. Scott wants something more intimidating than chirp chirp. He wants he yeah. <laughs> he doesn't like that. That's the uh, battle Hashtag cry. You're the bird. For, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything's better than hashtag chirp chirp. I mean, it has been stated okay. that the Cardinal so the is the fiercest robin-sized bird in the land. So, I mean. The reason I say that is because I transferred to Ball State from Purdue for Ball State's sports broadcast program. And when you leave Purdue and your your thing is boiler up, hammer down, and you go to. But it's because chirp, you chirp. make boilers. It's, it's, it doesn't apply. There's no fierce thing. Chirp Chirp is cool and unique, and the thing they do on third down. Yeah, but when you hear, like, 60,000 people going boiler up all at once and the big train whistle going with it, it's pretty <laughs> intense. B-Scott, we're going to just start saying Chirp Chirp. We're going to get, like, birds chirping playing over the intercom. It's going to yeah, sound, sound like a nice spring day. Anybody in the chat. 
please get behind me. What is more intimidating, a boiler up, hammer down, or chirp, chirp? Right, but like the thing is that there's nothing to Dusty, go to. You're out there, Dusty. I'm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Dusty. Dusty does need to weigh in here. Like, I mean, I would be more with you if there was anything that could apply, but there's not much you can do with Cardinals. I I, there's got to be. Some, I mean, Ball State has a marketing. <laughs> Hey, come on. Let's Pack the their eyes out. That's what... <laughs> Challenge to Ball State Sports Link. Find a better cheer, something more intense that you can market and use for the football team. Anything. Yeah, I mean, well, what is more, what is intimidating is what Ball State has going for them coming into 2021. Uh, you know, of course, this is a season where Ball State comes off of their first MAC championship in 24 years, their first bowl win in school history, and the first season ending ranked. They finished 23rd in the country and after 2020. The coach was on the hot seat coming into this year. Right. Well, and like, it's just like, so it's. His, his situation was the same as Brahms, though. Like, so many injuries kept happening to his team. Good players True. were down. Good players were down. And finally, it, it all came together. They stayed healthy. And what happened is something we thought was going to happen while we were at Ball State, but never did. I mean, I never would have thought Ball State would have been able to do it last year. I always thought, like, when we were there, I mean, we had NFL talent right. on I mean, that team. I mean, think about who we – It was crazy. Think about who we had. Like, even in the year – like, even the undefeated season, you had Nate Davis, Michael Lewis, Dante Ridgeway, uh Dante – is it – wait. Dante Love. Dante Love. There we go. We did have a player named Dante Ridgeway, but as soon as I started to say it, I was like, no, he didn't play Dante for – Dante Love was the one that got basically right. paralyzed. Right, yeah. One of the games against IU, um, yeah. where the first time they beat IU, uh, like losers, right? Who, um, who, who cares? <laughs> um, but yeah, um, and no, even Dustin, the years we were both there together. I mean, Keith Winning, Willie Sneed, Keith Winning, Willie Sneed, um, Jonathan Newsom. Yeah. Um, why am I like? Why am I blanking on names right now? The kid, the kid from Southside. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Um, I, I we like follow each other on Twitter too. I'm such a terrible person because <laughs> I was like, "Hey, a kid from Indiana, a kid I know, from Muncie exactly. that just plays really I well." Her, he, he kind of his play style remind me of T. Y. Hilton, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, um, you know, Ball State coming off of their best season in program history, they come into 2021, 18 starters returning, 16 super seniors. Quarterback Drew Plitt, who led the MAC in passing yards, second in touchdowns. I mean, Ball State comes into twenty twenty one with all the excitement because I mean, you know, for other Division one schools across the state, I mean, we'll be talking about them here in just a moment. You know, Notre Dame, like, okay, cool, they're probably gonna have a good year, but who knows, you know, what they're gonna look like? They play a lot of ranked teams. How are they gonna actually be something worthwhile this year? IU and Purdue, okay, you know, IU had a great season. Can they back it up? Purdue, can you stay healthy and get something going? Like, there's a lot of question marks uh, for all the other schools. And, I mean, don't get me wrong, there's Notre question Dame, marks for Ball State, too. beat somebody that has a pulse. Right. So, like, Ball State uh, just has the most going for them right now. So that's why they're number one on our uh, Indiana Ambassador Power Rankings. Yeah. It, I mean, like I said, Indiana's got some – we're not just a basketball state. Yeah. Um, so, uh, did you have any more honorable mentions or anything else you wanted to say about you? Indi- University of Indianapolis is probably my, my big one. Um, and always, it's always interesting to see how um, Butler does. I mean, they've got a little bit of a program going on there. University of Indianapolis is definitely the uh, the one that if there's any team that can jump in to these power rankings, it's them. I'd go with Hanover too. Hanover, I think it was either last season or the season before. Uh, they went undefeated, so um, they'll be a team to look out for as well. Uh, but, hey, without further ado, it's time to get into our uh, college football preview uh, where we're going to get into uh, IU, uh, Purdue, and uh, Notre Dame. Before we do that, we also want to say a big thanks to our friends of the show. 
Uh, first, we want to talk about Anchor. Uh, Anchor, you know, allows us to put on this podcast, allows us to have a platform uh, to put everything out on the uh, podcast, on the audio side of things. So we want to thank them for that. We also want to thank uh, Eat Lunch and Board Game, my cousin Adam's podcast. Um, you know, he does a great job over there talking about uh, board games. Um, you know, and all the bridges that they that, that can build. So uh, go over there and check that out. Also on Anchor, which also puts it on the same platforms that you get this podcast as well. Also, we've got some stuff to talk about in social media. You can follow us at Crash Course FM on Twitter, but you can also follow at Three C Media Sports. Very bummed to find out that Three C Media is already taken. But you know what? We're gonna go ahead and move on anyway. At but you know what? I like the Three C Media Sports because that's what we are right oh yeah we for sure support. it's a it's a good uh number two i just like i typed in 3c media and i was like and then i typed in 3c underscore media and both were taken and i was like you have got to be kidding me right now who has 3c uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to like dm them oh, and be like uh please uh change your tag immediately uh you can follow us crash course podcast on facebook that's also honestly likely to change to 3c media too i just have not gotten around to it yet um 3c media on youtube uh you can not only check out us every week on the youtube that side of things but you can also check out the mct podcast also uh you know they're one of the best uh you know as far as you know getting stuff out there and being one of our best videos uh, on the channel every week so go check out the mct podcast you can also see little snippets of the show going to be better about getting that stuff up there um especially with like all these college football previews and stuff coming out so be on they the lookout be better looking than we are that's I, why they get such good well it's like i theorized it's, true, though. it's like i theorized last I don't think week they're better looking than us i mean i don't know i mean todd a is pretty dreamy i'm not gonna lie he, he right. just looks right into your soul, man. It's 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 okay. crazy. Okay. Um, no, uh, but no, I I theorized it last week. I said I think it's because they listen to us um, on you know Monday or on Tuesday on their way to work, and then on you know Saturday they're just kind of chilling. They did some yard work, whatever. They're like, what can I throw on the tube? Um, and they throw on the MCT podcast. So I think that's why they get more uh, clicks on the YouTube side of things where they've, they've already heard us. They already heard what we had to say. They don't need to watch us again on the YouTube side of things. Although we would like you to. Please watch us. Um, <laughs> you can also go to 3C Media on TikTok. Yes, we have a TikTok account. Have some good uh, content planned for that as well. No dances. Unless you want to see a dance, then let me know. Uh, B. Scott's going to handle all the dancing TikToks. Uh, right. He's already he's learned the WAP. He's learned... Um, and also be <laughs> sure to follow us on 3C Media on OnlyFans um, <laughs> for a limited time because, unfortunately, I got to stop doing what I do on there because they're <laughs> cracking down on that stuff. Yeah, and it was... Sorry, maybe it was because of me. Maybe because they are like, ooh, no, ooh. that out there. Nobody wants to see that. Yeah, no, they're no. like, all right, we've officially hit rock bottom. We've hit an official low. We need to get that uh, taken care of. <laughs> this is a family site, for goodness yeah. sake. <laughs> and you can also listen to us every week on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever uh, podcasts can be heard. You can hear the Crash Course Podcast. And also, uh, as you guys are seeing right now, uh, if you're watching on Twitch, uh, or if you watch on YouTube, you can go over here. Or if you're listening to us on any of the podcast apps, uh, go over to twitch.tv slash Craig Crash. Uh, not just if you uh, want to see uh, me play video games every so often on there, but also if you want to see the podcast be streamed every week, take part in the chat. Dusty's here. He's asking why we don't have Alabama as number one. That's because Alabama's not eligible eligible to be number one Dusty, in, the Indi the in the Indiana Ambassador Power Rankings. Come on. Uh, no, but uh, Dusty's always here, uh, you know, yucking it up with us, so very happy to have him and everybody else uh, in the chat. So let's go ahead now and shift gears to uh, the Indiana schools. We're going to cover Notre Dame, IU, and Purdue, the three uh, FBS schools in the state. First, let's go ahead and start with Notre Dame, number nine coming into the season. Um, looking at their offense, uh, no more Ian Book, Jack Cohn in, as B. Scott mentioned earlier. Uh, in his uh, 2019 campaign, which is last his last season playing, he completed 70% of his passes for 2,727 yards, 18 touchdowns, 5 interceptions. He was 6th in passing in the Big Ten. You also get back Michael Mayer. 
Uh, leading uh, returning receiver, he's a tight end who got 42 passes for 450 yards and two touchdowns in 2020. Uh, you mentioned it, B. Scott. Uh, he's going to do a lot of handing off the football. Well, he does have Kyron Williams back there in the backfield with him, who on 211 carries last season ran for 1,125 yards and 13 touchdowns. He is their leading rusher. On the defensive side of things, the uh, Notre Dame defense was ranked 25th in 2020, they get back uh, defensive lineman Isaiah Foskey, who had four and a half sacks in 2020, the leader among returnees, and then safety Kyle Hamilton, 63 tackles and an interception in 2020. He was the tackles leader uh, when it comes to players that are returning. I think it was already just regularly the tackles leader for Notre Dame last year. Um, so looking at the Fighting Irish, um, I do think Jack Cohn is going to be a solid fit. I mean, he's coming from another... Uh, offense that is very run based in Wisconsin or at least is more known for being run based so it's not like he's being asked to go from a run heavy offense to go sling the ball 40 or 50 times a game he's going to be handing the football off a lot he's got um, you know a good you know, offense and defense behind him. He doesn't really have to be more than a game manager, uh, which is what he is uh, you know what you you know he is good at um, um and that, and that talented running game will be a safety net for him while new uh, wide receiver talents emerge because they did lose some talent uh, in the receiving core. Uh, the offensive line, though, will be key. There's a few question marks on the offensive line. And, you know, when you're a team that lost a lot of, you know, lost a lot of receivers and, you know, doesn't, at least in the beginning, look like they're going to be a ton of a threat as far as the passing game goes. You're going to be relying a lot on the offensive line, and if they don't step up to the plate, then that's going to spell bad news for Notre Dame. Uh, the, the Irish defense does has to have to replace NFL talent, but they do have enough firepower to be top 40 and be strong again in 2021. And their new defensive coordinator is one of the hottest up-and-coming defensive coordinators in the entire country, and Marcus Freeman. I'm still kicking... Purdue for letting him go when they fired Daryl Hazel. Marcus Freeman was an amazing talent, probably the best coach on that entire coaching staff at the time, and was at Cincinnati under Luke Fickle and built a monster of a defense down there. Look for Notre Dame to have a stellar defense in the coming years, if not even already this year, because Marcus Freeman is, he's good. One of the best. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, that's what I'm thinking is their defense could be top 40 in the country, which you think top 40. Oh, no, that's not very good. But top 40, I mean, there's 130 teams. So that's upper yeah. echelon uh, in, in the NCAA. So I think Notre Dame uh, has some solid talent. There are some question marks, but uh, they are geared up to have another good season. Yeah, I, I agree. This is a team that are they going to be in the playoff? You know, probably not just because they are starting pretty far back. And then when you look at, at their schedule and everything um yeah they, they do have some some good opponents in there they have some opportunities to jump um but i mean this is also a team that could very easily stumble against some of these teams or some of these even these unranked teams um and with jack Cohn at quarterback i don't i'm not as confident in jack Cohn as i was ian book um ian book could at least you know, sling the ball around. Jack Cohn, he's a good game manager, but I, I don't know. I guess I just haven't seen enough out of Jack Cohn as a passer to really feel super confident that he is going to be the guy that's going to get them up to the top four and potentially win them their first ever college football playoff game. So, I, you know, I don't. I think this is this is definitely a top ten team because of their defense. Their defense is going to carry them hard throughout this entire year. And if they make it to the playoff, it's because that defense got them there. Yeah, I mean, you know, it is going to be, uh, you know, but I mean, at the same time, I mean, they can be that team. They can be that team that wins it with the running game and defense. They don't necessarily have to, you well, know. In that case, it's basically, you know, you're, you're keeping the opponent off the field. Right. So let's go ahead and take a look at their schedule. Uh, first in September, they are at Florida State. Then they host Toledo. They host Purdue. And then they're going to be at home against number 12, Wisconsin. When the calendar turns over to October, they're going to be at home against Cincinnati. They're at Virginia Tech. They're at home against number 15, USC. And at home against number 10, UNC. And then in November, they have Navy at Virginia, 
Georgia Tech, and at Stanford. So uh, as far as a record prediction goes, here's how I break it down. Uh, I think they're going to go 4-0 and in uh, September. Uh, Wisconsin is a top-10 rush defense in the NCAA uh, uh, last season, but it's going to be a revenge game for Cone. I think, uh, you know, whenever you have, you know, a former player going up against his former team, um, especially because, like, Wisconsin isn't, like, the Wisconsin of old. Like, this is not... Um, you know, your, your grandfather's uh, Wisconsin Badgers. This is a team that also is sort of kind of looking for their identity and trying to kind of recapture what we're used to seeing from them. And so um, I think it's, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it's going to be a revenge game um, for Cone. He's going to get the win there. Um, and I don't think there's really any other team. I mean, yeah, it's going to be tough to go down to Florida State, but we always, we never really know what Florida State has in store. And then I think Toledo and Purdue are going to be wins at home. So they're going to go through um, a solid September. Then in October, they are going to go 3-1. and one. They're going to suffer their first loss. Cincinnati was 13th against the run last season. Um, now, you might say, hey, Craig, that was all against AAC opponents. Well, you are correct, but... Uh, last year in the Sugar Bowl, they held Georgia to 45 yards rushing. So, I mean, they are for real as far as the defense is concerned, and a lot of players... Marcus Freeman. Right. Marcus Freeman. <clears throat> a lot of players return uh, this season, too, from last year's squad. And the um, quarterback still Gunner Keel? Oh, my gosh. Um, and then they're going to go four... The pride of Luke Martin. <laughs> they're going to go 4-0 and oh in November. Uh, really nobody on that schedule in, in November really scares you. I mean, maybe at Virginia, uh, maybe Navy, because like 10 years ago they upset Notre Dame, and that they always bring that up every time they play Navy. Um, but uh, well, Going to Stanford. Maybe. It depends on, uh, like, I have no faith in the Pac-12 until they show me anything different. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, but my final prediction is that they go 11-1, and one, and you said that, I don't know if they're a playoff team. I mean, heck, eleven and one. Because this is this is how this is how I'm seeing it go in my brain. So, and I know my brain can be a, a weird place sometimes. Um, so stay out of there. They're gonna get wins against ranked Wisconsin again, and yes, they're going to lose to a ranked Cincinnati team, a top ten team, a team that's in front of them. But they're also going to beat a ranked USC if they stay that that way. They obviously they need all these teams or other teams Remember, too. You don't trust the Pac-12. Right, but what I'm saying is, you know, USC and UNC, if they can beat those two teams, UNC should be good. USC is probably the Pac-12 favorite coming into 2021. <clears throat> so if those two teams can stay solid, I mean, Notre Dame will have two, will end the season likely on a, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven game winning streak. Two of those wins coming against ranked teams. Um, who knows what other teams are going to falter in front of them? Um, because remember, I mean, Notre Dame essentially backed into a spot last year because the college football playoff didn't know who else to give it to. Um, right. So I, I'm not saying, I guess I'm not saying they're like a lock to be in either, but like 11 to 1 definitely puts them in the conversation because, especially with all those wins against ranked teams, I could see the narrative now being like, Oh, does Notre Dame finally, are they bucking the trend of losing to ranked teams when essentially the only good ranked team they played, Cincinnati, they lost to? So, um, but I still think they're going to be in the playoff conversation at 11 and 1. Yeah, you know, I, I think they could be in the playoff conversation. I just don't think they're going to be a playoff team just when you look at the teams that are ranked in the top four. I, Alabama's not losing. Clemson's a toss up. It's, you don't know. And then Ohio State and Oklahoma. I mean, it's gonna be a it's gonna be tough to crack like eleven and one. Yeah, that's definitely playoff worthy. But if you have four teams that, up there in the top four that are undefeated, right? Eleven and one doesn't get you in. And when you look at the conferences these other teams are playing in, it's just you don't have that much faith in them losing the caveat too is the fact that they need if they're going to be if they're going to lose to cincinnati they need cincinnati to stay good too they need they can't but have that could also hurt them right but no well i mean cincinnati <clears throat> end up taking one of those top like, cincinnati could be at five and then that's a buffer maybe but I really, mean, the, really you know how the college notre football dame, playoff notre works, dame though. really wants a <clears throat> shot at making the playoff they gotta go to that game against cincinnati is a must win to be honest 
it's a must win because you need to leapfrog Cincinnati. You're ranked right now behind them. And if Cincinnati beats you, and if Cincinnati beats you, Cincinnati's running the table. Let's just be honest. Cincinnati's not tripping up. If they beat Notre Dame, they're not. In South Bend. I do. Right. So, you, but you have them. You have Cincinnati beating Notre Dame. No, I do, and I think that'll happen. But <clears throat> what I'm saying is, like, I'm just going based on what we know from the college football playoff committee. Like, I just, I, I don't have a whole lot of faith that it will matter. Like, it'll matter more that Notre Dame loses to Cincinnati than it will that Cincinnati beat Notre Dame because all Cincinnati has to do is lose to Memphis. And then they're like, oh, well, Cincinnati stinks right. now. But, but and then so, like, they're, they're going to lose to Mi- – well, let's say they lose to Memphis, so then they're yeah. going to drop behind Notre Dame. Notre Dame's going to finish on a seven-game winning streak beating USC and UNC – and they're going to be – and, you know, somebody in the top four is going to lose a game, and that's going to get them right back into that. But what's going to help Cincinnati is that if they beat Notre Dame, that means they've also beaten IU. That's you, two right wins right there. Right, but it, they Early. also – basically all these three teams, IU, Notre Dame, Cincinnati, have to make sure they all stay good. Like Cincinnati right. can't drop off, or IU can't drop off, which I think they might as far as record goes. So, like – um. But you know, this is a this is a Notre Dame team that's going to be in one of the Power Six bowls or the, whatever they're called now. I don't know. They're going to be New Year's Six. One of the, New Year's Six. Yeah, they're going to be playing in one of those top tier bowls. It's all going to be okay, and it this they just may not be in the playoff, which I think if a Notre Dame team ends up getting left out of the playoff, that just might speed things up for getting. Um, an expansion done it honestly try not to get too far into uh next week but like it honestly depends on how ohio state looks how clemson looks because those are two teams that the college clemson football... is more of a wild card in my mind than ohio state but regardless either way both of yeah. those teams have to be good both Oklahoma. Of the, if, Oklahoma cannot drop a single game. Right. So if Oklahoma, because Oklahoma, Clemson, and Ohio State, which are three of the committee's four, you know, or five love teams that. that they love, like if those three teams are have two losses, then I mean I don't know. I don't like it'll be a th- we'll, we might actually see some variety. We'll see Notre Dame for sure, but we we'll, might actually see some like two different teams we're not used to seeing. So and we'll um, get more into this next week. Right. I don't want to derail us here, but right because yeah, this is going to be a fun. This is, it's going to be a fun year. Oh yeah, very excited. Um, what's your re- final record prediction before we go to IU? You know, I've got them at uh, ten and two. Who do you have I them think- losing to? I have them losing to Cincinnati and uh, North Carolina. Okay, I, I, I did possibly even nine. In, I, if not North Carolina, I could see them going into Stanford and losing, just because that seems like a place that even though even when Stanford is not really good, Notre Dame goes in there with a really good record, a chance to make something big, and then they fall flat on their face. Right. Yeah. In North Carolina, I was I was thinking about too, but it's the fact that they're in South Bend, which I know I have Cincinnati beating them in South Bend too. But like, I, it was the fact that they beat. North, I, what I feel like is a better North Carolina team in Chapel Hill last season. Now, I don't know if there were fans there, I guess, and that would have made a difference. But, but anyway, <clears throat> but yeah. So uh, you say ten and two, possibly nine and three. I say eleven and one. So I mean, heck, nine to eleven wins. It's not bad. Um, moving yeah. on to the Indiana Hoosiers, number seventeen in the preseason polls. I mean, you look at their offense. Michael Penix Jr. returns, fit, completed 56% of his passes for 1,645 yards, 14 touchdowns, four interceptions in 2020. He was fourth in the Big Ten last season in passing yards. Um, they do return their leading receiver, and Tide Freifogel uh, returns as the leading receiver, 37 catches for uh, 721 yards and seven touchdowns. Um, as far as their defense is concerned, <clears throat> not a lot to get excited about on defense. Uh, they were 10th in the Big Ten in yards per game of loud 378 they do get micah mcfadden back he had 44 tackles uh six sacks and interception in 2020 jalen williams and taiwan mullen lead the secondary who uh they combined for six interceptions so i mean this notre dame team is probably the best notre dame team that we can talk about over the last years indiana what did i say notre dame 
Oh yeah. We've said we said Notre Dame so much that I that I was that I had them on the brain. Right yep. Yeah. IU. They're one of the best IU teams we've seen in a long time. Um and so uh, you know but the only problem is is that they play in the Big 10 and they really have a Big 12 makeup where they can sling the ball all over the place but the defense is suspect and so is the run game. Um so Which is surprising uh, for IU. Oh, sus- suspect running game. Well, I guess it kind of hurts when one of your uh, top tier running backs decides to transfer at during training camp to your in conference rival Purdue. Right. Um, you know their you know their defense, like I said, is a huge question mark. Their biggest, uh, but their biggest question mark is the running game uh, being able to take the pressure off Penix because that's one of the things too. If you can't really run the football and all you do is pass, then, well, they're going to want to basically dare you to run the football and take away what you what you do best, which is passing. So, uh, it'll you know, their ability to establish the run is going to be key in their success this season. Um, but they are a program that's trending up. I mean, IU fans have a lot to be excited about this season, as we talked about in, their, uh, in the Indiana uh, Ambassador Rankings. Yeah, I mean, this is a team that's going to be fun to watch. And like I said earlier, it's all key on the health of Michael Penix. Can he stay healthy? If he can stay healthy, this team's a, a fun one to watch. They do have a legitimate shot of making a, a solid bowl. They're still looking for one of their first bowl wins since like 1990, I think it is. Um, you know, they all thought they were going to get it last year. And then Ole Miss said, not so fast, my friends, um, to quote an old IU head coach. Um, yeah, did you know that, Lee Corso? Yeah. He was the actually one of the most winningest IU coaches in history. Yeah, uh, he like I know uh, like I know more than I probably should about Lee Corso just from like the NCAA football video games. Like <laughs> he would always like interject uh, with like little random facts, like when I coached at IU or when I coached because he talked a lot about does he what is he because he I think he mentions that a lot like being at IU and uh, LSU and LSU. He left, he left IU for LSU I believe yeah, or Florida State. But, you know, th- this is a, 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 an exciting team to watch. There is a, they. This is a team though that is kind of strange because they lost a lot of some, some really good players to the transfer portal, and a lot of them went, went to Purdue. And now, like one of their defensive linemen that was going to be pretty good this year is going to be a starter at Purdue. Um, so that it's kind of concerning there when they're like they preach family and everybody loves their coach. It is. It's been fun and interesting also at the same time watching the rise of Tom Allen at IU. I mean, this base guy was basically a, a high school coach not that long ago. He was coaching at Ben Davis. So it's been interesting. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very intrigued to see how they do without a stellar run game because that's what they've been, that's what, what's been their bread and butter for so long is having that run game. Um, the other thing I'm looking at is the backup quarterback situation as well, because we all know Michael Penix just does not tend to stay healthy. Um, see how that goes as well. Obviously, the having Ty Freifogel is going to be big. That Their wide receivers are probably, I want to say, the third best wide receiver unit in the Big Ten. Um so that could that's that's definitely going to be good for them. I can't wait for the bucket game because that game could be a very high scoring affair. Just both of those teams, both of those coaches are well, at least Brom. I mean, if IU is going to be pass first this year, and Brom with his air raid offense, it, that could be a lot of fun. Oh yeah. Looking at the uh, schedule, speaking of, you know, the games on the schedule this year for IU, in September they're going to go to number 18 Iowa. They In September they're going to have Idaho, number 8 Cincinnati, and at Western Kentucky. Uh, in How would that slip in there? What? How would that slip in there? You got You actually have to go to Western Kentucky? Nobody yeah. ever has to make the return trip. Except Ball State, the year they went undefeated, had to play at Western Kentucky. Well, I'm talking about like when a big team right, big, goes yeah. up against, uh, you know, a smaller conference. Hey, you know what? I I like that. I, Purdue is, Purdue's playing at UConn. This yeah. Year. Well, see, and I I love that though because like you see it sometimes, and it, it, it's it's a cool thing to see. Like I you had to play at Ball State one year. Well, they, oh, that was the that was the year Dante Love got hurt. No, that wasn't. It was that was like it was the year it was Joey Lynch was the quarterback. Yeah, it was because oh, Terry Hepner okay. was the 
head coach. And Bill Lynch was the head coach when uh, they played IU that year that Dante Love got hurt. Uh, oh, Joey yeah. Joey Lynch was the quarterback. Ball State had a twenty three to seven lead and ended up losing twenty four to twenty three. And that and then IU anytime it's supposed to come to Ball State they go oh let's play it at Lucas Oil Stadium instead. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Well, I guess you could say the other return trip that we've seen is uh, USF. Yeah, came to Ball State and lost. They did. That was such. That a was the year game. that Craig got kicked out of the game. That Craig got kicked out of the press box. Did I get kicked out of the press box? You weren't like Luke Martin got mad that he thought you were not supposed to be there. No, that was at the end of the year with Ohio. Okay, that was the blackout game. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, no, no, he's no, not no. supposed to be here. <laughs> I got, oh, I got right. creds. I got creds, my guy. I got. I'm able to be here. Oh man! And then uh, in October, they're at Penn State, number nine, who's number nineteen in the country. They have Michigan State at home. Uh, they go to, uh, or they host number four Ohio State, um, and they uh, are then at Maryland. Then in November, at Michigan, Rutgers, Minnesota, and at Purdue. So uh, for a record prediction, um, I think they go two and two in September. I think it's a uh, brutal start against Iowa. You're in Iowa City. You're playing a Hawkeyes team that's usually pretty sound defensively. We talked about, like, hey, can they establish the run game? What's Penix going to look like? That kind of thing. I mean, last year, uh, the Hawkeyes were fifth in the Big Ten against the pass. Um, so I think that's going to be a really tough start. And then I do think they also lose to Cincinnati. Uh, so they're going to be two and two. In October, uh, you're going to play a Penn State team who is going to have a chip on their shoulder. They're going to be ticked they should off. not have lost that game. Right, because even that as... Was not, that was not a two-point conversion or a touchdown or whatever they, it was. Yeah. That ball touched out of bounds before it hit the pylon. Right, because even, like, with as bad as we saw that Penn State team be last year, they still should have beat IU. Um, I think if they had beat that game, had turned out, in Penn State's favor, I don't think Penn State would have been as bad as they were. They wouldn't have completely come apart of the seams. Yeah. Um, Same as when Purdue lost to Minnesota on that phantom offensive pass interference call. Purdue went in a tailspin after that. Right. Um, And then, so it's going to be a revenge game for the Nittany Lions, so they get the win there. Uh, And then they lose, uh, then uh, IU loses to Ohio State as well. But then they're going to finish off strong. They're going to go 3-1 and in November. I think at Michigan is going to be another revenge game for the Wolverines. I don't know how good the Wolverines are going to be. All I know is that last year they got hit in the mouth when they came, uh, you know, to Memorial Stadium. Uh, so I, I think Michigan's going to have a chip on their shoulder as well, just because they're big brother and they look at IU as little brother and they're going to come out and, uh, and get their revenge. But if I do they think... lose to IU at the big house, Ooh. Jim Harbaugh will be fired. On the spot, maybe. Uh, um, And then, yeah, I think they went out to finish the season. They beat uh, Rutgers, Minnesota, and Purdue. So uh, I have IU going 7-5, and which, I mean, the thing that's rough is that, like, like, they're going to be a 7-5 and team, but they're going, like, and so, like, normally that would be like a and i think because like of their brutal schedule that's why they're going to be seven and five they're not seven and five because they're a 500 team or a mediocre team they're seven and five because they just you know happen to have a brutal schedule the year after having one of their best seasons in program history so it's going to feel kind of like a letdown if you're an iu fan but i think like if you really are like get into the nitty-gritty and say like oh well yeah we're seven and five but we also you know we also had to play, you know, at Penn State, at Michigan, at you know, at Michigan. We had Ohio State, which I mean, they have them every year, but um, you know, we had to go to Iowa to start the season. We played, you know, a Cincinnati team that's, you know, one of the best since uh, Brian Kelly was there. Uh, so I mean, you know, it's just it, it it stinks because like IU should be happy about how their season turns out if it turns out the way that like I predict that it will, but they won't be because they're going to be too wrapped up in hey we were six and one last year whatever their schedule was and we feel like we should be contending for the Big Ten which they but never at the really same were. Time, if they all of a sudden start losing games, guess what? The reversible jackets flip back around and go Irish. True. So <laughs> it's. That's just the the way that fan base goes. I mean, literally, that's just how it does. Um, yeah, you know, that two and two start in September, I can see that happening as well. I mean, I could honestly see them going with a healthy team, 
week one going into Iowa and beating Iowa. Iowa, in my opinion, is always one of the more overrated teams in the Big Ten every year. So that wouldn't be too surprising to see uh, IU actually go three and one in September. I do see two and two in October. I don't see how they beat Penn State in uh, in Happy Valley. I don't see them beating Ohio State in Bloomington. Michigan State and Maryland are going to be train wrecks. So go ahead, give that one there. Um, at Michigan, I see them losing at potentially losing at Michigan. I don't know. That's a tough, I, tough, I guess that one's a big toss up for me as well, just because I don't know what Michigan's going to look like. I honestly do not. Um, Rutgers, that is one to circle as a potential. Rutgers and Minnesota are two. I mean, really, November could end up being a slippery slope because Michigan, Rutgers, Minnesota, and Purdue are, th- are four teams that you just don't know too much about how they are going to look. Michigan, I mean, Rutgers looked like they were on their way up, you know, with Greg Schiano back up at the helm. And Minnesota, are, are, is the boat sinking or are they still rowing it uh, up there in Minneapolis? You know, um, they do have a lot returning, which they were a pretty young team last year. They were hit hard with COVID last year as well. I mean, at one point they were down – to like I think it was like 34 players and they were playing like fourth stringers and yeah. it was it was pretty bad at one point for them so that's going to be interesting and then but Purdue we'll get into Purdue here in a second but I, I do like the seven and five record for them um, it just could be done in numerous different ways and I this is a bull team I will say that this is definitely a bull team six and six seven and five I can see happening maybe eight and four if they can pull an upset somewhere in September that's a that's a big push or you know I mean it, it like I said or I mean it could it, it, this is a toss-up with this schedule because on the front end it is brutal but on the back end there's so many question marks that a team could be underperforming or they could be overperforming or they could be injury riddled you just don't know so I, I'm going to stick with seven and five as well for them because I feel like that's a good comfortable mark, but I still feel like this is a bowl team. This is a team that's not going to miss out on a bowl game. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Like I said, I mean, <clears throat> it's, it's going to be like one of those years. And I mean, it stinks to say if you're an IU fan, but like it's going to be one of those years where like you're going to look at the schedule and be like, oh man, all the momentum we had from last year, we only went seven and five, but it's going to you know be one of those that like not a not a bandwagon or, you know, a, a diehard IU fan is going to look at the schedule and be like, oh, it's because we played all these tough teams. A and... diehard IU fan. You know any of them? A diehard IU football fan? I'm sure like one or two exists. Like I, I'm not – I mean, there's there's exceptions to every rule. So, I mean... Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I mean... Um, but you mentioned Purdue, because of course you did. So let's go ahead and switch gears uh, to the Purdue Boiler. Hey, because... IU schedule. I, 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 had to I, I know, I'm just messing with you. Um, <laughs> wow, B. Scott really homer trying to talk about Purdue in our uh, Indiana college football preview. Um, <laughs> no, but uh, Purdue this season... Um, their offense uh, returns nine starters uh, from a passing offense that was first in the Big Ten in 2020. They have Jack Plummer and Aiden O'Connell. That tandem was really good. They combined uh, for a 67% completion percentage, 1,854 yards, 15 touchdowns in 2020. David Bell is back. 53 catches, 625 yards, and eight touchdowns last season. Uh, he was, uh, you know, really key. Uh, you know, because didn't Rondo Moore miss some games last year? Or... Missed pretty much all of them, but he came back for like the last few. Two, yeah, two or three. yeah, it was a joke. And they do get uh, Xander Horvath back as well. Uh, their leading rusher, Go Yes, uh, 442 yards and two touchdowns for him. Their defense was middle of the pack in terms of the Big Ten last year. They do get. Don't their... even worry about that stat. Really? Why? Well, how come? New much that that coaching staff last year, the defensive coaching staff, all gone, well, all gone. They do get Yako, no more tucked in sweatshirt into the sweatpants, gone. <laughs> we we do uh, they do return uh so well, uh they do return their leading tackler in Jalen Alexander. He had forty nine tackles last year, and George Karloftis, uh, he will be a big shot in the arm for that defense as well. So I mean, just like IU. 
Uh, you know, they're kind of a Big 12 makeup in the fact that they're going to pass the ball a lot. The running game is a question mark, and their defense is kind of suspect. Uh, we'll see um, how good that defense can be. Um, their O-line is set to actually be pretty solid. I think they're going to be better than IU in that respect. Um, I, I mean, from what I read... You're you're of the majority, the minority there, my friend. Really, that's I mean, from what I read, flip re- flop. We think the strength is the D line, and the uh, question mark is the O line. Still, we just don't have a ton of depth after the starters. Okay, so depth, but the starters are good though. Yeah, but we have an O line coach that has a track record of getting his O lineman injured to the point of retiring. <laughs> well, hey, we'll we'll agree and disagree then, because I well, from what I read. I mean, I guess you're more plugged into the Purdue, uh, you know, fan base and Purdue's program than I am. But from what I saw when I read, uh, they, they said their off their O line could the be. The offensive line does have a chance to be really solid as long as they can stay healthy. Right, um, and then uh, the uh, uh, the offense should be fine. The biggest question mark uh, I think is defense because they lose Derek Barnes, who went to the NFL last year uh, on an already middle of the pack defense because you can change the coaching staff out but still that's a question mark so um you know purdue there's things to be optimistic about uh you're just hoping that the team finally takes that next step this year yeah i I think this is a year that they potentially could because they're very under the radar look bringing in brad lambert ron english mark hagan jamal adams basically revamping the entire defensive staff and having Jeff Brown be more hands-on and getting rid of the dictatorship that was Bob Diaco. Bob Diaco's defense of let's sit back on our heels and don't let them, don't give up a big play. That was his defense. Sounds like the The ball state defense. It was, it was a defense that was horrible. <laughs> That's it was a, awful. Like uh, we'll let you, our, we'll let you get, uh, we'll let you get 10 yards. Uh, we just don't want you to get 30. Exactly. That's how <laughs> Rutgers beat Purdue last year. Oh, we'll just dink. We'll dunk. We'll dink. We'll dunk. We'll dink all day. That's what it was. Well, now it's pin your ears back, go get the quarterback, get quarterback pressures, get sacks, force turnovers, play like your pants are on fire, essentially. George Karloftis is loving this new defense uh, defensive system, and he keeps saying it over and over again, and anybody that will listen, he will tell it to this guy is bound to have a breakout year. He's already preseason second team All American. Don't be surprised if he's a first team All Americaner and potentially a top 10 draft pick. I mean, he's set to have a huge year. Opposite of him is going to be um, second year Juco transfer, Demarcus Mitchell. This guy is, I mean, basically, this could look like a tandem of Dwight Freeney and Robert Mathis. You know, Dwight Freeney being George Karloftis, and it was a younger Robert Mathis who wasn't quite in his prime yet with Demarcus Mitchell. The linebacker, and then obvious, and then this, in the middle, you got IU transferred Damari Lewis uh, starting, um, Branson Dean, uh, Lawrence Johnson, some key seniors there as well in the middle. It's, I mean, it's going to be a team that's going to be able to plug some holes, so some some beefy guys up front. Yeah, losing Lorenzo Neal is a big loss. But I think it also might be some uh, gain by subtraction as well a little bit. Uh, linebacker, yeah, that was a big question mark, um, especially now. It's still a, it's a bigger question mark now with Samisi Bakasieki going out with a season-ending ankle injury uh, with, on the first week of training camp. Um, but the big addition is on, in that unit is um, Auburn linebacker transfer OC Brothers. He is apparently – just catching the eye of everybody right now and is playing out of his mind. So that's a potential there. And then also George Karloff's off this younger brother, Yanni um, is going to be stepping up, obviously Jalen Alexander. And then um, Jalen Graham is actually moving down to the linebacker position. This is a guy that is moving from safety throughout his career to linebacker. He's built more like a linebacker anyways. So the linebacking unit is getting better and, because of some issues with injuries earlier in the off season with Jalen Alexander and everything. There's some other guys that have had opportunities to run with the first team and it, it's still not going to be a strength, but it's not going to be as big of a weakness as everybody thought, but it could end up being a strength of this team. Secondary, obviously um, you've got a couple transfers there as well from Kentucky. Uh, you've got the uh, 
Division One, Two A, all like first team All American safety. Um, I forget where he's. I think it was Missouri State. He's from, but you know, and then you still have Corey Trice, who's going to be a pro someday at corner. I, I mean, it, it, there's some. It needs to be some more depth that steps up in the secondary, but this defense could be one of those defenses that turns and surprises people this year with how aggressive they're going to play and it could make teams uncomfortable offensively the offensive line needs depth but it's going to be a much more solid unit um running the running game should get a shot in the arm because of the line you got king daru healthy xander horvath who's always a big threat to catch it out of the uh, backfield um they did get a a big trans a couple big transfers obviously samson james from iu probably not going to be eligible this year so he's not going to most likely factor into it but um purdue did get a transfer from running back from unlv dylan downing he's from carmen and oh, well then he's the greatest running back of all time well he was really good actually no. his senior year <laughs> and um he was really good but this dude is he's He's some, he's turning heads in training camp as well. So there could be a three-headed beast there at running back for Purdue. It's going to be running back by committee for sure. It's not like it's going to be just one guy. And then obviously wide receiver is wide receiver. We don't even have to talk about that. Um, the quarterback job is still wide open. It's between Austin O'Connell, Jack Plummer, and actually Austin Burton is uh, throwing his is getting up there as well. So it'll be interesting to see who comes out of quarterback. I honestly think right now Jack Plummer has the inside track uh, because he's a little bit more athletic than Aiden O'Connell. He's got he's he's pretty much the best of he's got the best of both worlds. He's got a good arm and he can run a little bit, whereas O'Connell's got the better arm, not very athletic. And you got Burton who can run but doesn't has an okay arm. So. That's how it's it, – It's gonna. this is a team that's going to be very interesting to watch this year because if they can stay healthy, we may actually see what Purdue could have been. I definitely want to point out, though, uh, that the reason why I said, like, he'll be the best running back of all time from Carmel is just because of the fact that, you know, as someone who lived on a floor with, like, a bunch of Carmel people in the uh, – Yeah. Uh, oh, I had to hear how great Carmel was. Uh, Ooh, hey. <laughs> for uh for that whole year uh living in the dorms so uh always have to poke fun at carmel uh when i can especially because oh, uh too. they were my they were our rival in high school so especially because uh chris simmons uh are uh you know on the mct podcast uh he is also a carmel alum uh so uh looking at their uh record or sorry looking at their schedule uh for purdue they open up at home against oregon state then they go to yukon they're at number nine notre dame uh, and then they host Illinois. Turn the calendar over to October. They have Minnesota at number 18, Iowa. Number 12, Wisconsin. Um, and then at Nebraska. Um, and then in November, they're going to have Michigan State at home at number four, Ohio State, Northwestern, and then finish off the season in the bucket game against IU. So record prediction, uh, I think they go 3-1 and one in September. I think their only loss uh, is going to be to Notre Dame. Um, I, I just think, like, again, you know, Pac-12 team in Oregon State, not super sold on them. First game of the year, they have to come. Uh, you know, they're not the comfort of their own home playing like Portland State. They actually have to go to the Midwest, play. You know, you know, play. Um, you know, a, a game out of their comfort zone a little bit. Then they go to UConn, which is barely still a D, uh, an FBS program. Um, then you have, um, which kind of stinks because I remember when they were in the Fiesta Bowl. Um, yeah. and then they go to Notre Dame, which I think they'll lose, and then Illinois. If we're on the road, I might be more inclined to pick Illinois, but because it's at home, I will go with uh, the Illini. Um, and then in October, go with the Boilers. Go with the Boilers. Go with, yeah, yeah, go with the Boilers. Um, then in October, they're going to go three and one. Uh, they're going to lose uh, to Iowa, uh, number eighteen. Uh, they, uh, you know, of course, again, you're going to Iowa City. I know you said Iowa can be overrated, and they can be, but I think they're. Jeff Brom uh, does have Kirk Ferentz's number, though. Yeah, uh, like he's, he's only lost to Iowa once. But where was it? Was it in Iowa City? Yeah, but it was like by like, Ooh. Three, like four points. Yeah. But yeah, I think I think they will lose. I I do think though that they will beat and upset number twelve Wisconsin. Um, I don't know that Wisconsin will be number twelve when they face them. Uh, because I no, they'll lose to Notre Dame. <laughs> right, but I think Wisconsin's a little overrated. Like I said in the uh, in the Notre Dame preview, I mean they just 
Like, they are ranked based on, you know, they have a solid roster and name recognition. That's why they're ranked as highly as they are. I don't think their team uh, is as, as good as advertiser. I don't think they're a top 15 team. Um, and I think <clears throat> they're a borderline top 25 team, maybe not even. So uh, I, I think they're just very overrated this season. I think going into Ross Aid, um, I think, uh, you know, you know, and Purdue is itching to get that win over Wisconsin too. So I think they get that win there. Um, I know it brings up bad memories for you, B. Scott. Uh, <laughs> Purdue, <would> that <laughs> Purdue, Wisconsin, the uh, college where they – Kyle Orton. Uh, the face mask game. Face mask fumble. Oh, man. And then, though, B. Scott, don't worry, because I have the wheels coming off for Purdue in November. They go one. It wouldn't be a Purdue season unless the wheels came off. <laughs> the wheels come off of the train. They go one and three in November. They beat Michigan State to improve to seven and two. Everybody is excited in West Lafayette. They lose to number four, Ohio State. Okay, well, that's fine. We knew we were probably going to lose to them at the beginning of the season anyway. Um, and they lose in the bucket game to IU. Uh, but the big caveat, uh, the big game they lose is against Northwestern. Did you know that Northwestern uh, against Purdue is 6-1 and one since 2014? They haven't beat North – Purdue has not beat Northwestern at home since 2007. Uh, I was there. I was a student at Purdue. <laughs> so uh, it was 40 years ago that uh, – because <laughs> that's the last time B. Scott was in college was 40 years ago. No. Uh, but no, yeah. it really wasn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. B. Scott went to college for 40 years. Yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> but, yeah, no. So, uh, yeah, Northwestern, for whatever reason, has Purdue's number. Um, and I think that's going to be part of the wheels coming off in uh, November. So Purdue – Ends up being seven and five, but just like the IU season, uh, it's gonna be a, a bad taste in your mouth. You're gonna say, "Oh, seven and five for Purdue and IU," but neither fan base oh, is gonna be. No, 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 no. If we get seven and five, we're gonna be dancing in the streets. But if you, but if that plays out though, the way that the way it is, oh, we'll be happy after beating just beating Wisconsin. Okay, but you're telling me if they're seven and two, you're talking about, oh hey, it was supposed to be IU that was the team fighting for we'll Big Ten if supremacy. The, if the wheels don't come off the train in October. See, I think I think I beg to differ. I think if you're seven and two in the mix for the Big Ten, because one of those losses will be to Notre Dame, so I mean you're gonna have an opportunity to be in the Big Ten like championship talk. Uh, I think if you go seven and two and then lose three games, two of them, or one of them to Northwestern, and then to IU in the rivalry when game. I look at the schedule, I mean, I'm, I'm a big Purdue fan, but I can honestly, I can see it being as good. I mean, if, if following your schedule here. Well, it's it not my schedule, as, it's Purdue's schedule. Well, your, your outcomes here. <laughs> it could be as good as eight and four, nine and three, but it could also be as bad as like four and eight. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's for a lot of things you mentioned for IU, too. Really, I mean, um, the biggest thing that um, really we need to look at is Oregon State. That first game against Oregon State, if Purdue comes out victorious on that, this 7 and 5, you know, or better, is a, or 6 and 6 or better, is a true possibility. If Purdue comes out and loses to Oregon State, the wheels come off the train right there. Just by losing to Oregon State? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, they'll beat UConn. Then they'll lose to Notre Dame. Illinois is a toss. They could be – They could be. what they really need to be is they need to be that 3-1 and one coming out of September. If you are 2-2 two and two coming out of September, that, that makes for a, a very you, – you do need to pull an upset over Iowa or Wisconsin. You do need to beat Northwestern. There, that makes – you know – this Oregon State game, you need to get off on the right foot, especially considering Jeff Brom in his opening – well, technically, with Jeff Brom as the head coach at Purdue, he has yet to win a season opener. They won the season opener last year when Jeff Brom was out with COVID and his brother, Brian Brom, was assist essentially the head coach at that time. So Brian Brom is 1-0 in season openers, whereas Jeff Brom is 0-3. 
But see, I guess what I'm confused about is how you could be like, oh, well, we'll be excited if we go 7-5 and five and, the, and the wheels come off. Well, but, yet, because, but yet if they lose to honestly, Oregon State, I, the season's coming over. Coming off of the last two seasons, coming off of the last two seasons, it – seven and five would feel like a victory especially when you look at this schedule seven and five with this schedule would be super exciting you know the same thing with iu yeah it would be disappointing to them because of how good they were last year but whereas purdue like look this is a team that has struggled the last two years and for them to finish the season seven and five with an upset over wisconsin let's say that that is the proof that the Purdue fan base needs to see that the train is moving in the right direction. Okay. Yeah. We lost to Ohio state. We knew we were, we lost to Northwestern. We always do. We lost to IU. They're ranked. They're having a good time with their program right now, but this is Purdue getting back on the the track back on the right path at seven and five, you know, uh, a win that, that guarantees a winning season. Technically, Jeff Brom has never had a winning season at Purdue. Oh, wait, his first year he did. So he's had one winning season at Purdue. That is it. And if you can guarantee another winning season, that is that's huge to the fan base to say, look, we are making the right strides. We are going in the right direction. And that's what the Purdue fan base is wanting to see right now. So that's why I say seven and five would, would feel good, even though – the, the wheels fell off in November when a lot of us are thinking they could fall off in October. Yeah, I guess I see where you're coming from. I just, like I said, I think, I think just from that trajectory of like their, you know, could potentially be in the conversation for, um, you know, but we also are Purdue fans. We we know <laughs> that's we've been true. There, we've been close to the top and we've only been there once. In I'm, recent memory. I so, mean, we're not going to talk about the uh, the uh, tweet that I shared with you uh, the other day, even though it was basketball for Purdue. The uh, uh, <laughs> the the Delta variant one, where it's a picture of uh, you know my my summer or what is it my fall plans fall or my plan. I mean, my fall plans, and it's Robbie Hummel and the gang, and then it's the the Delta variant is a picture of the Minnesota bas- the Minnesota basketball court. Yeah. Yeah, sad times. Um, I, before we wrap up, I wanna. I forgot. I wanted to um, look up the uh, football roster for Ball State to figure out who that player was from Southside because I was gonna. It was. I was gonna kick myself for not knowing. Jamil Smith. Yep, there it is. I yeah. knew it was something Smith. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean that dude, that Ball State, those Ball State rosters are crazy. That's what I was like. You know, it's it's Who's the running back. Who was the running back? Uh, uh, Joan Edwards. Yes. Yeah. I mean, cause like that's what I talked. I talked to a, f- a fellow Muncie native and uh, and Ball State alum AJ Bramer about like the fact that like Ball State like not relevant for the longest time. They they have the undefeated season. Brady Hoke. They have all this great talent. Nate Davis, uh, McQuail Lewis, Dante Love. Was it McQuail Lewis or was it uh, Mike Quayle? It was Mike Quayle after <laughs> after the the undefeated season, um, and so yeah, the the arrow was going up. Then they have those really bad seasons our first couple of years uh, at Ball State, and then they the arrow starts going back up. They have Keith Winning, they have Jawan Edwards, they have Jamil Smith, they have uh, Zane Fakes. Is that was that the tight end? Yeah. Uh, and then they had uh, Willie Steven Sneed, Schott. Stephen Schott. Uh, they had a lot of of great talent and you're like man of all those teams like the guy that ends up winning the quarterback uh, out of Nate Davis uh, Keith winning and Drew Plitt it's Drew Plitt that wins the MAC championship and wins the first bowl game ever like that doesn't seem right but I mean hey that's sports for you you never yeah, would have thought right. you know of all the opportunities Ball State has ever had to be you know, nationally relevant and it comes with coach Mike New and Drew Plitt as the, the quarterback yeah, yeah. But yeah, that'll wrap up uh, this week's edition of the Crash Course Podcast. We uh, did our preview of all the Indiana schools, which means that next week we, we will... Ball State. We didn't touch Ball State. I mean, we kind of did. That's kind of what... That's kind of the purpose uh, for the uh, ambassador rankings, too, because it kind of got to look at other teams besides just us coming on and talking about Purdue, Notre Dame, and IU. Because like you mentioned, I mean, there's other schools around the state that... 
um, deserve recognition too, and I think we did a decent job of getting to them as well. So um, mm -hmm. it kind of gets you set up uh, for uh, the season as far as the state is concerned. And next week we will be talking about – um, you know, the national level for uh, the college football season, getting you guys set. Um, is it's Basically, it's preview season because we're going to be previewing college football. Then we're going to get into our, football, our NFL preview, a lot of, of football to talk about over the coming weeks. But we want to remind you um, that you can follow us on Twitter. If you want to follow just the Crash Course account, which is my account, at Crash Course FM, if you want to get on board with 3C Media, at 3C Media Sports. Um, you get on board with 3C Media. Yes, please do that. Uh, you can go visit us at Crash Course Podcast on Facebook. Like I said, that will most likely change to 3C Media Sports in the coming day, but for, in the coming days. But for now, Crash Course Podcast. Uh, remember, you can go to our YouTube channel, 3C Media, where you can not only catch us every week over there, but you can also um, catch the MCT Podcast. Those guys knock it out of the park every single week. We also have some uh, content specifically for. Um, the uh, YouTube channel as well, um, so be on the lookout for that. You can also follow us on TikTok at 3C Media. Um, it's got some good TikTok only content uh, on deck for you guys, um, so that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, um, I don't know what's happening in B Scott's house right now. I think it's crumbling to the floor, so we'll wrap this up quickly. Um, and <laughs> and then uh, honestly, that's that. I was stampede of dogs. You have stampede of cat. <laughs> yeah, stampede I'm not dogs. gonna lie, like. I'm already like home alone, and so like a little like jittery. So like when that noise happened, I was like, "What? What happened? Who's who? Who's breaking into my house?" Um. So, uh, but no. So, uh, you can also watch us live every week. Uh, twitchtv crash. Also, if you're into video games, uh, that's where I stream my video games as well. But we're live every single week, uh, talking about uh everything we want to get you guys involved in the chat like we did today dusty uh toddle and haas with the follows um thank you guys all for being in the chat and communicating us uh with us as always and then remember you can listen to us on apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, spotify wherever podcasts can be heard you can hear the crash course podcast b scott where can they find you find me on twitter at brandon underscore scott 87 and then uh, for a limited time only at uh, B Scott on OnlyFans, correct? Yeah, okay. I got to shut that down by the end of September. No yeah, hey, you know what? It, it, what a month it will be! I'm very excited to see oh. what you have in store, content wise. Ask me about my wiener. <laughs> oh my god! Well, that will do it for this week's edition of the Crash Course Podcast. Like I said, next week we will be talking about anything and everything when it comes to the national level of college football. Very excited to get into that. But until then, have a good one, everybody.